Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I wanted to talk about another pillar of why this podcast was created, community. Now, first, let me start by providing my listeners a little background about myself, and maybe someday soon I will interview myself for additional content. However, let's start small. One of the founding pillars of why I created this podcast is my community, all 98,000 square miles of the state of Oregon. In fact, in my current role in healthcare, my goal is to help build healthcare relationships and communities across the state of Oregon to improve healthcare for all. And I've taken this passion of working with community leaders, policymakers, business owners, and others to the next step with this podcast. My goal, the entire intent behind why this podcast has started, is to highlight our local entrepreneurs. America was built on small business is something you will hear me say often, a quote I got from a former guest. And if I can help provide a platform for my community to showcase the work to the masses to help improve our local economy, then I have reached my ultimate goal. But why is supporting a community important? From my experience, it helps broaden our perceptions of the world. The insight gained from the unique sense of purpose of serving those around you is quite fulfilling. Think of all the good volunteering does. Volunteering is in fact a benefit as it is statistically proven that volunteers regularly are healthier, both physically and mentally. Volunteering can also lead into leadership roles through skills learned during the volunteer opportunity. And remember, people skills are not the only skills learned while volunteering. A great example of this is Habitat for Humanity, which helps build homes. Being involved with one's community is enriching not only for the individual, helping build skills and networking with other like-minded individuals, but for the community as a whole. Today's guest exemplifies the same passion for the community in which she serves and the entrepreneurs in which she supports. The team at Founders Gym has helped raise over $106 million for the graduates through 16 cohorts in 25 countries supporting countless communities. Who knows, maybe volunteering isn't for you. But I do know one thing, you won't know till you try. This podcast was edited by Modern Ally, the business for small businesses and nonprofits who want their graphic design, marketing, social media, video, and other media projects done right. Modern Ally has a passion for supporting community education and social rights. The best part, Modern Ally meets businesses where they're at and works to create custom packages and services that fit your business needs at your budget. Say goodbye to overpriced, unpersonal, and out-of-touch agencies and say hello to your newest ally. To get started, visit yourmodernally.com or you can follow Modern Ally on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest is the Chief Operating Officer at the number one online training center that helps underrepresented founders build successful tech startups. She operates in the intersections of education, entrepreneurship, and social justice. A teacher, a board member, mentor, and co-founder of Accelerate Fun for Women Entrepreneurship. Please welcome Paige Hendrick Buckner. Paige, hey. let's talk. I'm so excited. Thanks We've been talking having... actually for a long time. We have, yeah. But, but now, now we're going to talk about something to founder Jim. Yes. Before we talk about that, I want to introduce the world to Paige. Please cool. give us a little background. All right. I'll give you a little background. So my name is Paige Hendricks Buckner, and right now I'm the chief operating officer at Founder Gym. Um, I mean, I live in Portland, Oregon, but I'm originally from Southwest Missouri. So I was raised in a really small town. I'm one of five, and I was just a really nerdy kid growing up. Um, I did band and speech and debate proudly and had a lot of fun. And actually, I wasn't very good at band. But, like I... <laughs> I was not great. What would you play? Played French horn. Nice. And I loved it, but I was not <laughs> great at it. But I was good at speech and debate. And so it's fun to see how that skill set's been carried into um, my career years later. 
But uh, after being raised in Southwest Missouri, I went off to college at the University of Missouri and I studied international studies and geography. And I thought, I'm going to be a human rights lawyer. I'm going to travel the world. And then I got into Teach for America. And so I started teaching fourth graders in Las Vegas. And I did that for fourth and fifth graders for three years while I got my master's degree there. And I met my now husband while I was teaching. And so I came out to Portland, Oregon to kind of see what it was all about out here and had a really great time, loved the community and loved my husband. So (laughs) he's pretty great. So we uh, moved here to be closer to him. And it was fun because when I got here, I didn't know what I would be getting into career wise, but I kind of wanted to get out of teaching for a while. And so I tried on a bunch of different jobs. I worked at the Apple store for a while. This is 2011. The economy was not popping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it was hard to find a job. But um, I started working at the Apple store. Then I started working at the Urban League, helping families get access to health care. And actually, it was while I was doing both of those jobs, I was teaching at the Apple store. And I met this woman who said, you should check out this job at Multnomah County as a policy advisor. And public policy is what I thought I was interested in when I was in college. So I got back into that. And I was there for about a year doing that work. And I ended as a policy director. And I left to start my first company. And so I was an entrepreneur running a business, pivoted out of the first iteration of that into the next iteration and learned a lot of exciting and painful, (laughs) very painful lessons. And while I was doing that, I was also doing some side gigs, modeling and teaching entrepreneurship to high school students. I mean, I did. And just doing it all. Oh my God. I think one weekend or several weekends, (laughs) I used to pour a cocktail and soda syrup to make cash (laughs) to buy groceries because the same year that my husband Darren and I got married, we also both quit our jobs and started separate businesses. We were talking about that today and we were thinking maybe we would try it a little differently next time. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I got into that and then uh, helped start an organization that served women entrepreneurs called Accelerate, which is still around doing incredible work. And then I found out about Founder Gym, this opportunity to join their team. And I joined in 2018 and I've been there since then. And now we're, here we are in 2021 and I'm now the chief operating officer. Now you're on my podcast. <laughs> Listen, it is really popping now. Man, your podcast, the economy is good. The economy is hot. <laughs> so first, before we talk about Founder Jim, let's talk a little bit about your previous entrepreneurial experience. Yeah. Let's talk about your first company. What was cool. it? First company was called Teak Box. And it was a monthly subscription box for Portland made things. Uh, it was kind of born out of just a weekend with a friend, a few friends at the coast, and we thought this would be really cool. So we started working on that like nights and weekends. And it was fun. It was a great idea for us to kind of crack into entrepreneurship. And I, I actually thought entrepreneurship was possible because of Startup Weekend. So I went to this event. If you Have you been to Startup Weekend? I have, are you talking about like pie? Yeah. It's, so it's a, it's a weekend event. It's put on by this. Now I think they're a global organization. But basically, you get together and you hack on problems for mm. 54 hours with strangers. So my husband had gone one it with his friend and then said, you should come and do this. It's really fun. And so we did this, you know, I, I literally left work at the county on a week. I was like Friday night at five, went there, pitched an idea and we hacked for like 54 hours and it was the best. It was so much fun. I just never thought entrepreneurship was a thing that I would be interested in until I realized, oh, you can problem solve from the private sector, not just the public sector. Mm, That's a good point. Yeah. So it was really fun. Um, so we kind of, that, that led to starting Teak Box and then my business partner and I went separate ways after entering an accelerator. She started a different business. And I started my second business called Client Joy. So I worked on that and from 2015. And then I sold it last year okay. to somebody who was operating it, which was great because I was ready to transition out of it. What, what did Client Joy do? Uh, Client Joy was basically a pivot out of Teak Box into serving businesses. So whereas before we were doing a subscription box for anybody who wanted to subscribe monthly, the lessons that we learned there, just first of all, I'm laughing, but <laughs> <laughs> nobody is sad or brokenhearted when their Portland made things don't show up. Uh, and so <laughs> I, this is where we learned the difference between like a headache problem and a migraine problem, right? It was like, hey, I wish I got Portland made things, but what we discovered are the customers that we were identifying, we couldn't identify enough of them at scale in order to make that business model work for gotcha. us and for the people that we were buying products from, which of course were more expensive. They're artisanal goods, right? So yeah, that was a really good experience. Um, but what Client Joy did was it took a piece of that idea, the idea that big businesses wanted to be able to give unique gifting experiences to their customers but struggled to do that at scale. So what we could do was we could build essentially like a custom gifting form for them and then they could send gifts anywhere they wanted to. So built out that business, (laughs) made a lot of mistakes, learned a lot. I'll never forget um, one holiday season. We ordered some caramels and they got shipped to the wrong address. And so they bounced back to the vendor in Seattle while I also had to deliver these gift boxes, 40 of them, 40 custom gift boxes to Seattle 
maybe like in three days. Mm. <laughs> and so I used to uh, practice jujitsu. So I had to go and clean the mats <laughs> because I couldn't afford to pay for my whole gym membership, clean the mats in the jujitsu gym, go pick up a rental van, throw all those boxes in, drive to Seattle, get the candy, repack the boxes and deliver them the next day by the deadline because I wasn't going to be able to ship them in time. <laughs> so I, Man. Just, I wish I could say that was the only time I made that kind of <laughs> dumbass mistake. <laughs> Or just, you know, it's like it, it was it was hard. It was a really hard business, but I'm really glad that I had the privilege of doing it and got to meet all the people that I did and um, and learn what kind of entrepreneur I am and the things that I'm not good at and the things that I really love and am good at. Yeah. And so then you you started to transition into Founders Gym. Now, you're not the owner, right? A right, founder, that's right. your chief operating officer. However, you've kind of been there since pretty early on. Yeah, I was one of the earliest team members and we have an amazing team. So... The thing that I think is interesting to me about Founder Gym is that we're helping, well, the leading online training center for underrepresented founders who want to learn how to raise capital for their startups. And I remember when I was trying to figure out how to raise capital for Client Joy, I just I had no idea what I was doing. And there were lots of books out there, but there wasn't anyone who was kind of holding my hand and telling me the truth about what it looked like. I mean, I had really great mentors. But it's not like they can tell me everything. That's not their job. Yeah. <laughs> like, can you please sit down and tell me everything to do? Man, I wish that happened for free. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I had a lot of really great advice, and and I didn't follow a lot. Of it. <laughs> That's the other part too. I remember this. Uh, my attorney at the time, Jason Gershenson, who is <laughs> amazing and the most patient therapist slash social worker slash lawyer that I've ever met in my life, was like, "You should really read Venture Deals," and I totally ignored him. And it's one of the first books I had to read for my job at Founder Gym. And I was like, oh, shit, I should have just read this <laughs> So anyway, so the thing I love about Founder Gym is that joining as an early team member, I, I had the privilege of bringing all the mistakes and the experience that I had made to a space with other entrepreneurs to show them, you know, from the perspective of experts, because a big part of my job is interviewing top investors, top funded founders, top lawyers, financial experts to help. Founders really understand what it actually takes to raise capital and the decisions they have to make along the way, the kind of business they have to build in order to be successful. So it feels a little bit like I'm solving page of 2014's problems, mm. but then also helping them just move faster than I moved uh, because I did not know what I was doing, nor ask for the right kind of help, evidently, <laughs> or listened to the help that was given. <laughs> so for the folks at home, let's kind of describe a little bit what Founder Gym kind of does yeah. and how it kind of helps folks. Founder Gym helps founders understand, I think, the culture of fundraising and what it takes to raise capital for their startups. The way that we do that, the vehicle for that is our cohort structure. So we essentially create this six-week experience where founders come together and through a combination of live training sessions with experts I talked to you about, they get to hear from venture capitalists, angel investors. We just added a session about angels and scouts. Nice. Because that's not, I think the scout programs are not as widely known. And so we added those components as well. Um, but then also the community. So the members of the cohort have accountability groups. And then we also have office hours. So during those sessions, I give folks live feedback on their fundraising materials to help them really understand how to craft compelling narrative, both through what they say, but then also what they show on screen or what they email in advance to investors. So it's really fun because I think folks come to Founder Gym for the tactical, right? I want the exercises. I want the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I want to build my network. I want to hear from these top investors, founders live, but they stay for the community. Because what ends up happening is yeah. they build this incredible network, a deeply woven network of other underrepresented founders around the world. Because since we started our first cohort in 2018 and we just closed our 17th cohort, so we're launching oh, wow. that cohort. <laughs> I'm so excited to meet these founders. It's our first Black Women Founders cohort. We've served 542 founders in 25 countries on six continents wow. for, for 16 cohorts. Wow, that's incredible. It's incredible. And they're all amazing. I feel so privileged. To serve them. It's crazy because, I mean, you guys are here in Portland, Oregon. Actually, we're just, but so you're I'm in airport. Portland. Yeah. And so there are people and I'm in Portland, Oakland, Alabama, and we have a team member in Canada as well. Nice. So when, when was Founders Gym founded? So Mandela Schumacher Hodge Dixon is our CEO. She's a force of nature and I love her. Um, she started the company in 2017. The first cohort launched, though, in January 2018. Mm -hmm. And so in, since 2018, we have been busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I must admit, I 
you know, did my due diligence and did some research and, and, and reading all of the uh, all of the great articles. So if you guys want folks listening at home, you can Google Founder Jim. A lot of great, great content. In fact, just Google page. Thank you. You will get a lot of awesome <laughs> some boring content. content. <laughs> Listen, some hit or miss fashion and hair mistakes. Please know I was an entrepreneur and that was not a priority. <laughs> I'm proud of it. I'm fine with she it. Looks but... great. It looks great. So so why why was Founders Gym kind of created? Yeah, that's a great question. So Mandela has had an incredible track record of experiences that have started with her being a sixth grade teacher. We both did Teach for America together. That's actually how we met in 2018. And so she was a sixth grade teacher. Then she started a startup. And then after starting a startup, she raised capital. Um, She learned from that experience. She had customers. She learned from that. Then she went to work for a top venture capital firm. She has been an investor herself. And sitting in all those different seats, being an ecosystem builder, because she also worked at Startup Week in Education, building a global startup ecosystem. She really saw how hard it was for underrepresented founders to successfully raise We know a lot of that has to do with the systemic inequities that have been so deeply crafted, (laughs) intentionally crafted, right, for centuries that have kept out women, people of color, LGBTQIA folks. So with all of that in mind, she wanted to really democratize education when it came to raising capital for tech startups for underrepresented founders. And so after seeing all this and deciding she was going to craft something with that teacher experience, also, she's an athlete. (laughs) So she's a successful collegiate athlete, a soccer player, just an all around hustler, too. She works very, very hard. And so she decided I'm going to weave together what I know about this world of entrepreneurship and raising capital with my experience as an athlete and then coming together as a teacher. So like all of these things wrapped up to create Founder Gym. So that's why we call it Founder Gym, right? because we give our founders a workout. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy work. Listen, it's six weeks of intense work. Well, okay? let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. Let's, let's go, let's get through that. I want to, I want to kind of hear what does the cohort go through? What, what can one of the clients, you know, that actually get, you know, how do they get selected one founders gym? And then what exactly do they go through training? How rigorous is it? Can they really expect? Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's so fun. We're getting ready to start another cohort. I can see how excited you are. So excited. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> it's so fun because, you know, and I always we have orientation here in two weeks. Is it two weeks? No, it's next week. It's next Monday. But it all starts out with founders applying to Founder Gym. So you can go to foundergym.com forward slash apply when our applications are open or you can submit interest and we'll reach back out to you. But when founders apply, we're looking for founders who fit a few criteria. So one is we're looking for founders who are building tech or tech enabled companies. So we've had founders who've come through Founder Gym who are building businesses with physical products, for example, but they want to scale that to a global level. They uh, want to raise money and they're clear about that, that they need a significant infusion of capital to get to that global size because they want to serve a really large market. Um, But we're also looking for founders who demonstrate collaboration. They really want to be part of a community. They don't want to go it alone. In fact, our tag is we all go up together because we try to foster a space where people feel welcomed Mm -hmm. and also feel excited to learn from other people and their various lived experiences. When folks come in through our application process, we have a selection committee. We review the applications. Not everyone is accepted, um, though we've had founders who haven't been accepted apply multiple times Nice, and be accepted later. So I always encourage people if they aren't accepted the first time, no That's shame. Yeah. Every place yeah. like, has that process, right? Happens. Applications for accelerators, um, top accelerators, top incubators. So once they apply and they're accepted, then we onboard them. It is a paid program. So people pay to participate. And once they join the program, they have orientation. And then we're off to the races. (laughs) So every week we're covering a different topic, whether it's an investor's perspective. So live, I will interview a top investor for this cohort, cohort 17. uh, I have the privilege of interviewing Arlen Hamilton from Backstage Capital. Amazing. Yeah. (laughs) Incredible author, speaker. Just like mover, shaker, brilliant, brilliant human being. So I get to interview her and I'm bringing together questions that our founders have oh, for nice, her, nice. but then also questions that we know founders need to know that maybe they haven't think, you know, thought yep. to ask. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we like to, you know, make sure to share some fun things about Arlen. People can't find on the Internet that she can just share there. And so during those live sessions, they also get to ask questions live, the founders who attend. Nice. So every week with that theme whether it's an investor's perspective or numbers talk where they hear about the metrics they need to successfully fundraise, um, whether it's legal matters, we were bringing a startup lawyer who talks about 
hey, listen, this is the you know, the stuff you really need to think about. Please get incorporated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And here's trademark like, that. <laughs> please, or like get incorporated as you know, C corp instead of an LLC if you're going to go raise mm. venture capital. It's yeah. like those little things that right. people don't always know. Or we have how I raise capital. So that's from a founder's perspective. This time for cohort seventeen, we have Ellis Lamkins. She is one of the most powerful women I've ever met. She started a company called Promise. And I believe at this point she's raised $23 million. Wow. She's a Y Combinator wow. alum. So she's going to come talk about her. She'll just like real talk. I think that's the thing that I want to bring up is each of these sessions with the live trainers is real talk. Yeah. Like, yeah. What, what shit did you go through? How did you navigate people telling you no, telling you no in a great way or in a terrible way? How do you follow up? Like all those little nuances. Definitely. So not only is it the live training sessions, but then they also have a lot of homework. <laughs> so they're watching videos of past interviews we've done with past expert trainers. Um, they are completing exercises every week. They have to complete five um, items before they graduate to be considered a graduate of founder. Gym. Nice. And then, of course, like I said, they attend office hours where they're getting live feedback on their live pitches or their investor email template or whatever document we're going over that week. And they have accountability groups. So they're getting together and meeting with each other to talk through challenges that they're having in their business and then also preparing all of their homework assignments essentially before they finish. And what's really cool is, okay, so this is busy. Every week you've got live sessions, you've got homework to do. By the end, founders are ready to pitch. And so they deliver a two-minute pitch at graduation day. And all of the, the other founders who are watching them pitch give them live feedback. Oh, nice. Which is really fun because right. it means it's an opportunity for them to learn so yeah, we have a lot of fun in the, the experience and we try to make sure that founders are working really hard and they're pushing themselves, but they're also getting really clear about their why, why they're the right one, and then communicating that effectively. So once our founders graduate, complete all their homework assignments, all of their deliverables, um, then we publish a graduation article. And that graduation article goes out into the world and really does showcase every single founder who graduates. So they get a small profile with their photo and then they can go share that they've they've graduated. And then a lot of our founders, once they finish the experience, are ready to go out and raise. So they have mm, the documents nice. they need to be successful. Right, right, right. So it's intense. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I kind of want to, you know, give the folks at home a little bit of the experience of going through, even including yeah. myself, I, I've never gone through the venture capital process. I've yeah. never had to raise capital for a company. So I'd love to kind of just go through the process of what can you expect, mm -hmm. right? What What does that industry kind of look like? What does making a pitch look like? You know, you mentioned there's kind of different ways to communicate, right? Via email or call in and mm -hmm. the meeting process. Mm -hmm. But again, without giving away the farm of, of what Founder Gym is all to offer, although it sounds like the best thing is is the in-person thing, right? Being able to go and meet with you guys in person seems that. And more virtual, actually. I forgot to tell you. Oh, that. even better. So right? we've been completely virtual since 2018. That's See, just the, <laughs> I, that, that's the, worth the money alone, right? <laughs> just having having those home. mentorship. <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about the venture capital process. You know, individuals that have a C-Corp and sure. going to try to raise capital. What can they expect? What kind of landmines should they be to watch out for? Yeah, good question. I think the first thing you need to figure out is whether or not venture capital is a good fit for you. It's not for most businesses. Mm. And that's fine. That's totally fine. You can build a great business that's successful without raising venture capital. Frankly, you can do it without raising capital at all. There's lots of great examples out there, folks doing that. So I, I think first you need to figure out what does your business need to grow? Um, and before that, I feel like I can hear Mandela in my ear right now. She's not here, but <laughs> I feel like that's something she would say is like, what kind of business do you want to build that aligns with your own lifestyle? And so what do you want this business to do? Mm. Is this a lifestyle business that you want to build and and pays your bills and makes you really happy and it's something that you love doing, but maybe you don't want to grow it super huge or bring a ton of other people in? Do you want to build a, you know, a global scalable business? Do you want to build a small business? I mean, small businesses can be large, right, you know, can right. bring in millions of dollars a year. So it's really about understanding what you want to build first and how it aligns with your personal goals. And so once you figured out that, like, what kind of business do you want to build? And then what do you need to get it there? And then you decide, OK, I want to be, I think, a billion dollar business. Um, we are building something that's scalable and you then have a plan for that capital. Mm -hmm. So we do this thing called uh, fundraising 101 on Instagram and Twitter, where we share out from one of our expert trainers. Oh, one nice. of those recent tips that I shared was from Julia Collins. She's the CEO and founder of Planet Forward, and she is the first black woman to ever build a business that then went on to become a unicorn. She's raised over $500 million. Wow. 
She's exceptional. And so she she also launched Moonshot Snacks. She's a climatarian. So she builds businesses. Moonshot? Them. Like the chocolate? Yes, actually. It's oh, funny. so good. <laughs> so, but it's it's uh, not the chocolate. It's um, their crackers. Oh, wow. Uh. Buy a case. Just save yourself. All right. And then, <laughs> <laughs> listen, <laughs> just buy, buy, buy a case. I just did. And it was the best experience. Anyway, sidetrack. So back on yes, track, track. <laughs> just a quick moment. Moonshot Snacks eat their crackers. But the thing that I love that she shared is... You know you're ready to raise capital when you have a vision for what you want to do with that. And so if you're if you're like, okay, I think I want to raise venture capital, well, you need to look at your milestones for the next 12 to 18 months. And then mm. how much money is it going to take you to get there? And then figure out, okay, so if I know it's going to take me this much money because I have to you know, pay people, I have to get, buy space, equipment, right, whatever, right. then you're able to go figure out, okay, so I need to raise this much money. Here's the kind of investor I want to work with. And I think that's another big piece of it that... I did not realize, <laughs> again, not because people didn't tell me, maybe I just wasn't <laughs> listening, but um, it's about finding the right investor mm, for you, right? right? And that is finding an investor who is aligned with your your vision and your mission. This can't be someone that you fake it with because- You can't fake it till you make it in this- <laughs> You're getting kind of married to this yeah, person, okay? Definitely. And so that means that you got to be able to call them when things are hard and ask for help and be honest with them. They need to be someone who's aligned with your vision and they're on board with whatever it is that you you want to do. Or maybe they're not, but they can keep it real with you and help right. you get there. So, you know, finding an investor who not just brings money, but brings a great brand, brings a network, brings advice, brings mentorship and support. So as you think about, you know, with those things in mind that we just talked about, and then when you want to go out and raise, you need to have a plan and you need to have the right stuff. And so what that means is fundraising can take you a very long time. I think some of the fastest raises I've seen happen can happen in like 30 days, <laughs> but that's not often people have done this for the first time right? Gotcha. <laughs> or mm -hmm. don't have really strong networks. Um, that certainly hasn't been my experience or a lot of experience uh, that I've heard from underrepresented founders. Typically, it takes them longer just because they're building those networks if they don't already have them. And then also trying to build the story. So it's about building a really great process to go and find the right investors. And you could meet with a lot of people. So I think it was Elizabeth Yin from Hustle Fund. And I hope I am quoting this correctly, but I saw a tweet where I think she talked about how she took 700 meetings before she actually got oh, wow. the capital she needed. So also expect that this is going to be challenging because yeah. you're asking people to part with their money to invest in you and believe in you. And you can, you should expect to hear no, and but work really hard to be the kind of founder that people want to say yes to. So if you've done your research and you've found the right investors, you've created a great lead sheet, you've created a great process so that you're reaching out to people, following up with them after the pitch. You also need to make sure that that pitch is really tight. So it's not just about running a great process, but it's also about giving a, you know, telling a compelling story. I think every single investor that I've ever interviewed has talked about how the story is so very important. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, one of the things, you know, we, we hear often is the investors aren't just investing in the product, but they're also investing in the entrepreneur themselves. One thousand percent. One thousand percent. And it's Charles Hudson. I think it's Charles Hudson from Precursor Ventures. I just love hearing him talk about he's like, I'm looking for the right founder. And this is really critical at the beginning of your business, especially when you don't have a product or you don't have a long track record or a lot of traction. You're betting on you. Right. Yep. So you have to walk into that room flexing it was what we talk about all the time, but just flexing on your lived experience. And that can be both personal and professional. Mm -hmm. And so it could be like this is a child care issue and I understand it as a parent. This is a menstruation issue. I understand that as somebody who menstruates. Right. Like. Yep. And you can come in and talk about that and then you can marry it with as a professional who, you know, has worked at X, Y, and Z brand or just done X, Y, and Z thing. This is how I plan to execute, recruit the right team. So one of the reasons I love the work we do at Founder Gym is helping our founders understand how to really be clear about those flexes, yeah. how to internalize them and remember them. Because I think we all do this. We get really busy and we forget all the things that we've done. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> right? Definitely. I mean, how many jobs have you had? How many jobs oh, have yeah. you had? I've had a lot. I just had a lot just working at OHSU by itself. And before that, I've had many before 100%. That. And in each one of those jobs, you've picked up some interesting skills definitely, or lived experiences or networks. And so we try to help founders remember those things as they walk into the fundraising process. They carry all of that with them. And even if those lived experiences just help them build rapport, yeah. maybe with an investor that they're talking to, that's a step in the right direction. Yeah. And, you know, we, it's kind of funny, you know, one of the episodes 
um, previously is one, we talked about expenses, the hidden expenses, oh my gosh. right? You actually <laughs> talked about software and I was like, yeah, people actually don't think about, but not yes. only that, your time, right? <laughs> Charge for your time. That's a podcast. Right? That's you your gotta, next podcast. That's my, it's just called time. <laughs> just about God time. <laughs> Shit that takes time. <laughs> yes. It, and this stuff takes a long time. <laughs> yeah, man, so I'm, we were talking about earlier how I was like, man, I'm going to have somebody start editing these damn podcasts because it takes so much <laughs> time. I got a kid. I need to feed this child, man. <laughs> we got things this to do. Needs food? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, education. Just, I can I thought they would just give her some money, go to the be <laughs> fine. So your and, toddler figured out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that was so important, you know. And talking about the, them saying no, oh, people yeah. are going to say no, and, and don't don't take it to heart, right? Mm-hmm. But the biggest thing is that relationship building piece you're kind of talking about. Critical humanize it, right? Make it practical. I think that's, you know, that's one of the things I kind of excel in in my current role is where I focus or or when I'm building a relationship, right? I do Mm -hmm. talk about personal things like, Hey, yeah, I do have a child and I did graduate college and I did do all these things. I'm not boasting. I'm building a relationship. Right. Boast. I'm, but I gave boast. Yeah. <laughs> flex on us. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm flexing on you, but in a These very my- nice, <laughs> politically polite way. <laughs> Listen, this is my list of flexes. Read them. Yes. <laughs> I'm a father. Okay? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, but it's also, it's, it's a way to make it practical, right? Because yeah. people want to know that you are, in fact, a human. You, you bleed, you cry, right? We all have these emotions. They want to see your drive. Yeah. That also makes you driven. They want to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yes. I think, yes. And so I always, I love quoting, uh, founder gym expert trainers because they're some of the coolest people I've ever met. I'm just thinking, is it Adrizio de la Cruz? He's the founder and CEO of Arcus and he's really fun. He's just, he's brilliant. He's so brilliant. And one of the things he said, uh, to the cohort that he was talking to is be the most Barack Obama version of yourself. <laughs> it's like, that's so baller. That's <laughs> like the swagger. Right. And I think what he was saying and, and what he went on to explain was that when you walk into a room, whether it's, you're talking to customers or investors, or you're recruiting people to your team, you want to be someone that people admire yeah. for the things that you've done and for, for, you know, what you are capable of doing. And, That comes back to who you are as a person. And that shows up in so many ways, professionalism, getting, following up with people. It shows up in being prepared during a meeting, before a meeting, after a meeting. So I love this so much because I think everyone can strive to be somebody who's admirable Mm -hmm. if they really lean into what makes them that person, the Mm -hmm. right person, right? So, you know, I I will never forget, there's a a great company I'm thinking about. The name is uh, God. It will come back to me and I apologize. (laughs) It's gone. called God. It's called <laughs> child brain. <laughs> As in like, I have a child and I'm currently pregnant with one and I cannot remember anything. Um, I wish I, I had a different uh, reason, but it's that. Anyway, so <laughs> these two teachers, I met them and I remember actually kind of holding back tears while I was interviewing them for the cohort because they're just so incredible. But they're in Beaumont, Texas. Um, they're both in education and they started this platform that helps families who have kids on the Asperger's spectrum figure out how to find the right resources for them, whether that be like Mm. uh, play places or dentists, like you just thinking about creating a great quality of life and a great experience for those families. And they love it from such a, like such a special place. Yeah. And they're in Beaumont, like tiny Beaumont, Texas, and they don't know anything about venture capital, but now they do after they went through the cohort and they're both amazing. So anyway, I, I keep coming back to founders like that because we were talking about this earlier because we're virtual, we serve cohorts, our founders are from all over the world. That's amazing. And so it doesn't matter where you come from. You can still get access to this knowledge, which I think is one of the reasons Mandela was so geeked out about starting this. She didn't come from Silicon Valley, but she wanted to bring it to everyone. And I think democratizing that access will help us shift generational wealth, which will help us also shift generational power to fix a lot of the, the systems that actually have made it hard for underrepresented founders to get capital to begin with. Definitely. Looking back on everything from the beginning, you know, starting in uh here in the downtown city, Portland area, working for the city of Portland and then now coming an entrepreneur. And what would you say, you know, was surprising or that you learned? What were some nuggets that you would say like, well, I didn't know about that. Or actually I'm like, Hmm, that was a, that was an interesting thing I learned. From the public servant perspective or the entrepreneur perspective? Just all of it. Okay, cool. From the beginning. When I was a policy advisor at Multnomah County, I worked for an elected official. My job was to work with constituents and geek out on (laughs) 
And I truly mean geek out. (laughs) Public policy issues, budget issues. I think that I was looking at the world from kind of an academic perspective is probably Mm. the best way to Mm -hmm. put it, right? right? Because you look at budget items about like tax issues or public policy changes about tax issues, specifically business taxes. Mm -hmm. I've never been a business person at this point in my life. I'd never been a business person. So I didn't really understand, I think, the ramifications of some of those things. Like I I knew them academically. I could tell you the stats about them. But I think being in business, it's helped me better understand just a different way of doing things. So I think in when I transitioned out of public policy – Often what I would think a lot about was how bureaucracy is intended to be slow. And there's lots of good reasons for that, I think. But I also am the type of person who's like, I want to hack on things. I didn't understand the terminology for it, but human-centered design, thinking from the perspective of the person, the constituent, as we build policy and think about it. I think public sector entities do try to do that really well, but it's hard. Mm -hmm. I think there's natural tension there that makes it challenging to really get everything that people need into the works of public policy every day, right? By the time it finally gets to council meeting, um, it's kind of hard sometimes to have made sure that you captured everything. And that's the nature of democracy, I think. I like that about public policy. I struggle with that about public policy. In entrepreneurship, you really do have more control over how fast you go. So whereas when we're in public policy, we're trying to do these things slowly, democratically, we're talking to lots of people where, you know, if there's a budget to be approved, there's all these budget sessions where right. we're going and talking to all these folks in my business. If I need to make a decision, I can make it really quickly and pivot really quickly. And it's funny. I was just talking to my brother. He just launched today is his launch day. Actually, nice. Congratulations, <laughs> brother. Yay! So he started his <laughs> business called Remote Share, and he is a high school teacher who's been doing this at night and all, on the weekends. And um, with the help of some really great organizations, one of which is 1871 in Chicago, He's gotten to this point where he's at launch day and he's like, what do I, what do I need to be thinking about next? Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, okay, so like, let's set up your 30 day sprint. What do you need to, like, what are your big objectives? How do you roll that out into key results? How do you then figure out how to run a sales process? Like, what's your hypothesis? So you get to do this for yourself, but the hard part is you're doing it with just yourself. Yeah. Right. You're the jack of all trades. You don't have a huge team. And one of the, the issues he was really struggling with was, I don't have a full time team right now. So it's launch day, but it's really just me all all the time. Right. Thinking about these things. And he does have a team. It's not not everyone is full time like he is. I think the the biggest nuggets out of my just delirious tangent that I just shared with you (laughs) is that entrepreneurship moves really quickly, which I like to solve problems, but not always with all the resources that you need. But also that can be really exhilarating. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Because you're like, I just stayed up all night or I just drove to Seattle to deliver these gift boxes (laughs) in a minivan. (laughs) So I know we kind of discussed it, but for the listeners at home, please tell them how can they get in contact with Founders Jam? How can they, you know, submit their information? Where can they find you guys? Great. Can to give them the, the 411. Yeah. So if you are a founder who wants to build a startup, um, you can always just follow us on social media and we talk about startup advice. So we're at Founder Gym, F O U N D E R G Y M, on both Instagram and in Twitter. We're both there. Um, I would say every day. We're probably <laughs> posting every day yeah. <laughs> because we love to share what we're learning and mm-hmm. we want to make sure that folks out there who are just building get to know. Uh, what we're learning every day. And then if you are interested in applying for a cohort, you can go to foundergym.com forward slash apply. And if we're not currently accepting applications, you can enter your email address and then we will let you know when applications then open up. Um, And then you can reach out to hello at foundergym.com if you have any questions. And we have an incredible team and they will follow up and respond. Uh, So yeah, that's how you can find us. Nice. So you founders out there, feel free to reach out. Paige, Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This, this was, was awesome. This was so fun. I'm, I'm, this was going to be one of my favorite episodes because <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to, after this, we're going to talk a little bit more about this incubation right. sessions. Yes. I'm going to get in there. I want to talk about yes. Geek so, out. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Paige Hendrick Buckner, the chief operating officer of Founder Gym. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.